Okay, welcome everybody to the Shanghai Lectures, um, today again from Berlin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, we are um, going to um, start today again from Humboldt University to Berlin in Germany, like last week. Um, if you remember last week we were talking on, on evolution and this week the topic is on is de developmental robotics. So that's where we are. And let's go quickly through today's schedule. So we start with a short introduction and also the remaining side presentations. Um, I think it could be Olaka, Pisa and Madrid, but also Australia, maybe. <coughs> and uh, afterwards we have a student presentation on framsticks. That's an uh, evolutionary simulator, which very well fits to last week's topic from uh, Poznan in Poland. Um, after this introduction, we start with uh, lecture five on developmental robotics. And um, we also have a very interesting guest lecture today on robotics in the human brain project by Florian Röhrbein from TU Munich. And um, that's the schedule from today. So, um, just a quick question for the Framsticks presentation. Are you ready for that? Yes. I am ready. Okay. So should we start now? A second, I have to give uh, presenters right. <coughs> okay, so the presentation is by Konrad Miazga. So, um, welcome. And please uh, try to stay within uh, five minutes for the presentation. Okay, I will try. <laughs> okay, so hello, my name is Konrad Miazga. I'm from uh, Poznan University of uh, Technology, Faculty of Computing. And today I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, Framsticks. Framsticks is a, a software that has been developed since 1996 on our University and uh, what uh, are Framsticks exactly? Framsticks are a software that allows its users to uh, simulate and uh, ev evolve uh, artificial creatures in a three dimensional environment. And uh, such creatures uh, consist of uh, two main parts these are their body. So uh, their uh, physical structure and their brain, so neural network that controls uh, their behavior. And the nice thing about Francis is that we can uh, evolve uh, those both things at the same time together. And there are many uh, uh, points of users' interests, uh, as we can see, starting from simulation, cognitive science, and computer science uh, to even entertainment. Uh, there are uh, quite a few users of the software and there are many types of users, uh, for example, students, teachers and scientists. Here on this slide we can uh, see uh, some of them. And uh, the software itself, it has uh, many modules, uh, but I will focus on uh, two main modules. These are a simulator a graphical user interface and a simulator a command line interface. Graphical user interface is better for a small experiments where we want to uh, see uh, what is going on in the experiment in the real time. While command line is uh, much uh, better, it is preferred for uh, big experiments where we just want to uh, start the experiment and uh, don't really look at it until it's finished. 
And there are many experiments that we can perform with uh, Framstick software, uh, such as uh, synthesizing agents and studying their uh, behavior. We can even uh, study behavior of whole populations of uh, agents. Uh, we can uh, do experiments with evolution of communication, etc. So uh, there are really many, many different experiments we can perform with this software. And now I, I, I will uh, say a, a few more things about uh, some of those possible experiments. First one is uh, synthesizing agents. There are two main uh, ways uh, to uh, create uh, such uh, an individual in the Framstix environment. First way is to uh, evolve it, uh, just using evolution. Uh, and the second way is to uh, make them uh, from the scratch using uh, Framstix editor. Uh, the screen here is from older version of uh, the editor. Uh, current version is web browser based. Uh, we can also study their behavior. On the left we have a uh, an image of a uh, such creature of a frown stick. And on the right, we have uh, a picture of its brain, of neural network that is uh, controlling uh, the behavior of the agent. And the nice thing is that we can click at, on any neuron and we can see uh, the neural response uh, and how it changes in time. So th it is really a nice uh, tool for uh, generally uh, testing uh, how uh, the brains evolve. We can also investigate evolution. Uh, here we have a, a tree that describes the process of evolution of some population. Red lines are mutations, white lines are crossover operators, and as we can see there, uh, we can uh, see uh, four big uh, breakthrough points. Uh, we can call them milestones where uh, evolution, uh, something big happened in evolution. So this is another way we can use the software. Uh, and there are many uh, potential behaviors that uh, Framstix can uh, show, starting from simple ones like walking, swimming, jumping, and rolling, uh, through uh, more and more complex ones like memory, communication, even maybe in future feelings and consciousness. Okay, uh, right now it may be quite far-fetched, but in the future it may be possible. And uh, if there is one thing you should uh, take from uh, this presentation is that the Framstick software is free and it's available to be downloaded from its web page. It's uh, framsticks.com and uh, you can use it in your experiments if you want. You can also use it in uh, Koans 4 and 6. So if you want to do it then uh, by all means. The presentation itself should be available online, and I think now we are ready to show a, a one-minute video. Okay, uh, so on this video uh, we will uh, see uh, three different behaviors of frown sticks. The first one that we can see right now is uh, evolution of their speed on land. Uh, so. Uh, we can see that there are many uh, behaviors that allow them uh, to uh, move around. Okay, now uh, we can see uh, frowstics that has been that have been evolved uh, to uh, for their ability to uh, swim in water. So uh, this may uh, be uh, nice uh, for Kong four. Okay, great. And last uh, but uh, not least, uh, we have from sticks uh, that are evolving their uh, ski jumping abilities. And okay, uh, so I think that would be it uh, from me. So uh, thanks for your attention and okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. So, um, as, you, as you have seen, it's a bit similar to the Carl Sims demonstrations we saw last time, and now you can um, try it out by yourselves. Um, the next thing is other side presentations. So, which side is ready? Who wants
wants to go first? I think there's a presentation from uh, Launston. Let me see if uh, James is ready for that. <coughs> okay. So I will uh, keep this nice and brief. But, um, we're actually not connecting from a university in Tasmania. We're connecting from a hacker space called the Innovation Circle, which is um, our, basically attached to our museum uh, in Launceston in Tasmania. I'll give you a really brief overview of what the Innovation Circle is. Basically, it's a collaboration between uh, our local museum um, a couple of industry partners, so someone who, a company that builds electronics and a software development company locally, and then the wider community as well, and particularly uh, young people who are interested in learning electronics, computer programming, and those sorts of things. Uh, we run a number of education programs that include uh, project based learning, so we often get people to work on. Uh, work on projects together where they're learning skills as they're building things. Uh, we also have a number of mentoring programs that are in place, so we get young people working with people who are uh, in industry and working on uh, working on different projects in their companies. So this is a photo of Mike Cruz, who runs a pick and place assembly company in Launceston, um, who's working with a number of high school students and teaching them about electronics manufacturing. Uh, and of course, we have a, a really collaborative focus as well. So we um, we look at team-based projects where we have mentors working closely with young people on the same project. We've run a whole heap of education programs. So one that we ran earlier this year was called Recharge, which was basically learning electronics by having. 10 or 15 students coming together at the same time. We took them over to the museum so that they could learn about some of the challenges and opportunities that the museum faced. Um, and then we brought them back to the hacker space where they worked for three weeks to develop different uh, projects. And so this is uh, where we were kind of distilling the ideas and coming up with ideas that uh, we wanted to work on as a group. And then here are a couple of participants in the program working on a guidance kiosk for the museum, basically where you we 3D printed a model of the museum, we embedded some lights in that model, and then you had buttons that you could press. So if you wanted to visit the planetarium, you could press the planetarium button, and a trail of lights would light up from where you were to the, to, to the planetarium in that model. So we also had a number of guest speakers come through. Um, so this is someone locally who does a lot of work with technology and health. Um, and then we've got a number of different projects that we're working on as well. So um, the kiosk is one that I've already talked about. Um, and then we've got a train simulator that we're working on as well, where we've built a custom control deck and then are using Unity 3D to allow people to drive a train around a virtual track. Uh, and that's probably about it from me. So that's basically the um, the innovation circle and the hacker space that we log in from. It's been a real pleasure and a real delight to participate in the Shanghai lectures so far, and we're finding that a lot of the university students who are in our community are really enjoying coming along to these lectures and, and learning about robotics from some of the best people in the world. So thanks very much. Thank you, and we should mention that it's like 7.15 in the evening in uh, Launceston, so thank you for staying up so late. Seven fifteen is not very late. <laughs> well, um, yeah, then let's start with the main lecture for today on developmental robotics. Um, I think there's still a microphone on in Pisa, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks. Um, so, if you remember, last week we were talking about the different time perspectives, and um, 
we were mainly looking at three different perspectives. So we had the, the here and now, the short-term perspective, the ontogenetic perspective, and the phylogenetic perspective. And um, um, just to repeat that, so in the, in the here and now perspective, um, we had to, well, we were looking at the level of the designer commitments. So in this here and now perspective, everything had to desi be designed by, by hand, so hand design. Um, then in the ontogenetic perspective, we have to design initial conditions, we have to design le learning and developmental processes. And in the evolutionary, phylogenetic perspective, we have to design the evolutionary algorithms and um, how the morphogenesis works. Um, we've been looking at the evolutionary perspective last week in more detail. Um, just to repeat uh, a bit, the here and now perspective, what is it? It's everything which does not involve learning or development over longer time scales. So it's, it's what is at the present, it's the interaction of an agent with its environment. And as examples we had here, we had Simon's aunt on the beach example, where the aunt has to go um, on the beach, uh, going around different um, stones and sand. And we had the Breitenberg vehicles as an example of the here and now perspective where the sensors and motors are pre-wired, and even though the, the agents, the vehicle here, is expressing some really interesting and complex behavior. Um, actually, um, I noticed that I didn't mention the frame of reference problem last time, and nobody noticed. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you rem remember, we have this challenge, so if some of the main lecturers does not mention the frame of reference problem, and you are the first to notice, uh, you could win a bottle of chip champagne or some um, Italian biscuits, some cantucci. So I'm not sure who's getting the cantucci now. Uh, Fabio, maybe <laughs> maybe I'm the winner because I'm the, the only one who noticed. So... Um, <laughs> Fabio's not here? Okay. Um, well, so please uh, pay attention. If somebody mentions the frame of reference problem, then um, you could win a prize. So, um, the other time perspective which we looked into is the evolutionary perspective. So, um, here we had uh, a lecture last week on evolution on uh, artificial evolution and how it is related to real evolution. Um, and today we're looking at the perspective here in the middle, the ontogenetic perspective. That's all about learning and development of, of, a, single, of a single agent during its lifetime. So we already had one example here which is about um, how we could compare human development um, and how developmental robotics can be inspired from human development. And uh, we will later look into more detail into these examples here about human pointing. And um, well, just as a disclaimer, so um, today I will present uh, several of the several research of, of my own group because we're, we're working um, a lot in developmental robotics. Um, so, of, but of course, there are, there are lots of other work which um, I don't have the time to mention, maybe. So, um, let's start with um, a person you all know, Alan Turing. And uh, he's not only famous for the Turing machine and the Turing test, but he's also one of the first to suggest artificial development principles. So already in, the, in 1950, he had this idea, and, and he wrote this, this text here. He said, um, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child? And um, if this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. So he, he had already, in the 1950s, he had 
basically the idea of, of um, <laughs> Uh, artificial artificial development and how you could reproduce development and learning in in machines. And he continued um, with, "Our hope is that there is so little mechanism in the child brain that something like it can be easily programmed. The amount of work in the education we can assume as a first approximation to be much the same as for the human child." Um, of course, it's not quite that simple. So there's. Uh, it's not just a little mechanism in the child brain, but uh, there are lot, lots of things already um, um, which are already there. And uh, but the basic principle, um, he was of course right that that um, intelligence is really too complex to be completely programmed, and it has to emerge during the course of development and during the the interaction of of the child or of a of a robot with the real world. Um, there's actually there's a there's a very good book on developmental robotics which I would like to recommend. So that's by um, Angelo Cangelosi and Matthew Schlesinger, um, and uh, you can see on the on the main cover that's the that's the robot eye cup, which is very often used for for experiments in developmental robotics because it has some some childlike properties. And um, there's also a specific conference which deals with developmental robotics. So it's the International Conference on um, development, in <coughs> development and Learning and Epigenetic Robotics. And it's, it has taken place for, for many years already. And this conference discusses all the research which is related to, to developmental robotics and how how robots can develop um, skills and, and how it can be compared to, to human development and learning. So um, the ontogenetic perspective, um, which is basically, we could call it developmental robotics or epigenetic robotics, it's, it's um, basically the same, it has the same meaning. Um, what should be mentioned here is that is the relationship also between evolution, which we learned about last week, and development, because um, you, you can't really separate these processes. Um, evolutionary and developmental principles, they are strongly intertwined. So they, they influence each, each other. And of course, there's, there's also the, the nature-nurture debate, which we heard in one of the first lectures by Hot Pfeiffer, that um, there's still a big debate how much, how much of intelligence, how much, how much of the, the skills that will develop are already innate at birth, and how much is then learned during the lifetime of, of, the, um, of the person. So we always have to think of all these three time perspectives. So we can't really isolate one of them. We always have to think of them as, as, a, as a whole. And um, what we look into in developmental robotics are different aspects of human infant development. Um, there, there are some points which are particularly interesting. One is sensory motor learning. So how, how the child can uh, interact in the real world, how, how uh, a child, how he can grasp something or, or point to something or learn how to work, uh, walk. And um, another thing is learning of social skills, so how to interact with other people. Um, examples here are imitation learning, for example, or joint attention which are very important social, social skills. And what we also think is that, that basically all these sensory motor skills are a prerequisite for learning these social skills. So the development happens in stages, as already um, the famous uh, child psychologist uh, Jean-Pierre Chez mentioned, that you learn certain skills at a certain stage in, in, your, in your life. And then you learn other skills, and, and so you develop these different stages 
in an open-ended uh, development, basically. Let's just um, have a look at one of these skills and how we, we can study them in developmental robotics. So joint attention. Um, there has been a strong interest in the, in the robotics community, um, both in human-robot interaction and in developmental robotics, in joint attention, because um, joint attention skills are important for quite a number of, of, of other uh, skills. So imitation learning, social cognition, development of language, and all sorts of intuitive interaction between humans or between robots and humans. And um, there are some um, several works on joint attention. You can hear some work, um, conceptual work we did with the um, IBOS at Sony CSL Paris uh, some, some years ago and also some, some work on joint attention. Um, on the right you see um, Yuki Dagai with the Infanoid robot having a, a joint, shared, joint shared attention between the robot and uh, human. And um, if we look at the human developmental timelines, we see that, you can see here that, that all these skills, they appear at certain times, also in different stages. So we see some prerequisites for joint attention here. So we see attention detection, attention manipulation, social coordination, and intentional understanding. And these are all prerequisites for uh, reaching a, a real the skill of joint attention. And for example, you can see here in T2, you can see that at the age of roughly nine months, children start with imperative pointing as a request for reaching an object. So basically, they, they start pointing at at, um, at something, but with, they, they do it whether an adult is in the same room or not. And then a few months later, at about 12 months, um, it's called declarative pointing. So pointing is really already used for attention manipulation and, and, and using gestures. And it's uh, very interesting to, um, to kind of re replay these, these stages using robots because there we see what are really the prerequisites and what what is already what is already there in children and, and, and in robots we can see what we what we put in and how it develops. So um, again, developmental robotics. Um, Embodied AI plays a major role for, for developmental robotics because intelligence is really the learned experience from an interaction in the real world. Um, of course, you, you see that from, from young children here. You see that, that little girl that um, does some real um, sensory, motor, sensory motor interaction with the real world by spreading this um, carrot thing over the table here. And, uh, um, well, I guess she learns a lot by doing that. And um, so for, for all the experiments we do in developmental robotics, the interaction with the real world is, is hugely important for, for development. And just to remind you of the embodiment hypothesis, uh, the embodiment hypothesis states that intelligence emerges from the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensory motor activity. And um, it means that, basically it means that all the cognitive, affective, and bodily mechanisms, they're, they're really hugely intertwined. So it all is, is, is all connected. Um, I'd also like to show you some platforms that are often used for experiments in developmental robotics. So um, two of them, well, we just saw the, the Infinite robot from, from um, Osaka Kyoto. And um, here you see on the top, you see the ICAP, which is the main platform that is used in developmental robotics. And uh, on the bottom, you see the, the NAR robot, um, which is also often used for experiments in developmental robotics. Um, so why is that? Why? Um, why are humanoid platforms often used? 
Um, well, one reason, of course, is we, we study human development. And uh, therefore, humanoid robots are, are quite well suited for that. So for example, they could, they could, um, they could do walking. They could do grasping, um, pointing, sharing attention, and so on. And um, for sharing attention, I'd like you to look at one video now on the attention video for the ICAP. Um, Nathan, can you please play that? So you see the robot is currently being repaired. It still expresses some interesting behavior. Okay, thanks. Um, and so I'd like to ask some questions to the, to the uh, global audience. So um, what do we think, what are the prerequisites for attention behavior in a robot? Then uh, another question, what could be, uh, what could be the purpose of implementing attention or behavior into a robot? And how is that related to the frame of reference problem? And since these are three, uh, already three questions, I'd like to take again a short break. And so you can internally discuss these questions. And then we um, come back in, in five minutes uh, with, the, with the answers. So um, who wants to start with their, their answer? Perché mi ha aggiunto lui? Chi? Quello lì. Ok, we can start in Plymouth if there's no one else. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, prerequisites for attention behavior in robots, motion tracking, perhaps some simple form of facial recognition. It needs to pay attention, you know, be able to pay attention to the same person at least for a little bit. Um, purpose, imitation learning, as you actually mentioned earlier, also social interaction. We've had examples before of the simple robots that just pretty much just nod along to someone and it develops a social bond. Um, and for the frame of reference, it's an example of where you can get a lot of simple behaviors working together to perform a complex task. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Um, yeah, here in QV Mac. Okay. Um, what, um, as one of the prerequisites for attention behavior in robots, do we need to know why children give attention? Is it just um, because of um, discomforts or um, curiosity that they um, 
innately have or are there other reasons and do we need to address those before we start looking at um, programming attention in if that's yeah Done. <laughs> Sorry, answering a question with a question. Yeah, that, well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. Yeah, I was kind of posing that. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Any other um, explanations? Answers? So we could summarize our, our local discussion and if you want to. Yeah, I can. So basically, um, we said that prerequisites for attention behavior in a robot is that it has to like, get some sensor input from the environment and also have some motor skills to be able to focus attention. And the purpose is um, to imitate what um, also already said and to learn from other people to survive because only if we pay attention to our predators, for example, we can survive. And also for um, making a more natural uh, human-robot interaction in regards to shared attention, for example. Yeah, so basically that's what we discussed here. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any other answers? Okay, I think we came up with uh, quite a good uh, list of, of reasons of why we should um, um, give attention skills to, to robots. Um, and um, so we were looking at these humanoid robot platforms that, that could be used. And of course, as you saw in the, in the um, ICAP video now, already by, by just the, the robot turning their, their head in, in, and looking at, at maybe some some noise or some some movement, it already gives an appearance as if the robot is really understanding everything and, and um, by just paying attention. So um, that's also the relation to the, the frame of reference problem here. Um, so if you don't have a humanoid robot in your university, you could also use some simulators. And I want to. Um, again, point at the, the WebOT simulator um, where Olivier um, gave a presentation two weeks ago. So you can um, you can model the now robot in the in the simulator, and there you can try out different different things uh, where you need a humanoid robot for. Um, now, I also want to mention something completely different. Um, there is even an opera on developmental robotics. So I guess it's the very first and unique opera on developmental robotics, which has been um, created by um, Luke Steels and Oscar Villaroya. And um, um, it is, is the story of a humanoid robot called Caspao, who is bought by the greedy Graziano against the wishes of his wife, Rosalinda. And to Graziano's disappointment, Casparo turns out to be a developmental robot. So this is, of course, very disappointing, a developmental robot um, that needs to be taught everything, even how to walk or speak. It continues, and then, moreover, Casparo has become imprinted on <coughs> Rosalinda and consequently does not want to listen to Graziano. Graziano loses patience, becomes angry, and wants to reduce Casparo to a scrap of metal. But Rosalinda comes to Casparo's rescue, and the story ends in harmony, like a typical opera, of course. And um, you can have a look. Um, you can have a look uh, on, on YouTube, and you can watch the whole opera. It's very nice with um, uh, baroque music and so on. So an opera on developmental robotics, if you want to combine. Uh, robotics and, and uh, opera. Um, so let's continue with some more research uh, related topics in developmental robotics. I'm going to present some examples on body maps, which are representations of, um, of uh, body skills, sensory motor exploration and learning. 
So uh, we start with body maps. They are inspired basically by somatosensory maps in the human cortex and could present a dynamic and short-term representation of body and behavior. So basically somehow you have to, uh, if you don't want to have purely reactive behavior, you have to somehow um, represent your uh, morphology in, in your body and, and brain. Often it can't be really separated. And uh, there are several uh, works on that. One of them, for example, is that one where maps based on information distances are built. Um, here there are some experiments with this, this IBO robot um, who does some sensory motor exploration. And by doing that and by just feeding the, the, the pure, the raw sensory motor signals to this algorithm, um, some, some structure of the body emerges without having been um, explicitly implemented. Here you can see on the, on the right graph, you can see that particular areas <laughs> represent the head of the robot and others, the shoulders and the hips and so on. And this is all. Um, completely emergent from, from um, um, information distances. Then there are other ways um, to represent um, sensors and self-organized sensors. So one example is the epigenetic robotics architecture by Anthony Morse and, and others. And um, I won't go into detail into that because next week um, Anthony will give a talk um, also on developmental robotics and language. So um, maybe he, he will mention this, this architecture here. Um, but several um, works are based on, on the error net. For example, um, some work here with self-organizing maps. So you see self-organizing maps that represent certain um, um, sensory modalities or motor modalities and they are self-organizing and adapting. So in that example, um, we're using dynamic self-organizing maps, which are adapting to the current um, structure of the body, to the current morphology, and also to the, to the learned skills and the, and the task the robot is performing. And um, the framework is quite nice, um, this framework, which is inspired by the era. Um, because you can easily implement different modalities. So you could, for example, not only have the, the proprioceptive modalities, but also include an auditory modality for, um, for sound, sound recognition. Um, so far to body maps. Then I'd like to show you some experiments on, on motor babbling. And um, basically motor babbling is um, what is called body babbling in the child. So young children in, in the first weeks and months, they, they just do some completely random or appearingly completely random movements, like moving their arms in, in a certain way. Um, and they're doing that the whole day. And by doing that, they learn the relationship between um, what kind of muscle activity is, is, is on the arm and where the hand is in relation to the face, for example. You can they bring the, 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 the hands to the mouth and so on. And um, after a while, you can, you can use that um, the other way around. So for example, if you want to put your hand to a certain position, then you already know from your experience what kind of motor commands you have to give an, in order to reach that position. And in these experiments, we did the same with this humanoid robot now. So the robot did also um, the similar, similar movements. Um, I'm not sure if you can, can you see the robot moving here? Or, or OK, I think that's, that's fine enough. Um, you see the robot performing these, these um, random movements and at the same time learning how to map the, the motor command with the position of the hand in the, in the visual space of the robot. And for such a quite um, 
simple robot with a um, uh, low number of degrees of freedom. It's enough to do completely random motor babbling for a few minutes, and eventually you've covered the whole <laughs> sensory motor space by, by doing that. But if you have a more complex robot, um, that won't work. So it would take you ages to explore the whole sensory motor space, especially um, if you have a, um, a soft robot with many, many degrees of freedom and uh, nonlinear behavior. And um, there are also a number of other exploration strategies which have, which have been um, uh, invented. One is a goal-directed strategy. Um, there were some works by um, Matthias Rolf and Nino um, uh, Asara and uh, Jochen Steil on doing goal-directed exploration here. And there's also a, um, a third possibility here, um, using intrinsic motivation strategies. So giving the robot a specific motivation to explore certain areas of the sensory motor space in favor of, of others. And um, that's some work by Yves uh, Audoyer, Frédéric Kaplan, and myself. Um, and I will also uh, show you what, what kind of experiments they are done, again, with this IMO robot in, in, a, in a real children playground. Um, but first, let's have a look at this goal-directed exploration. So um, one robot that has been used for that experiment is the bionic handling assistant from Festo. And um, well, the bionic handling assistant is on the right. The inspiration for that um, is on the left. So basically, it, it has the same features as an elephant trunk. Um, it's, it's actuated by pneumatic actuators. And uh, it has many degrees of freedoms. And it is very difficult to design a control system. And that's, that's also the case for soft robotics. Um, you can reach very natural behavior, but it is very difficult to take like classical control approaches and apply them to, to, soft, to soft robots. First, because it's way too complex, and uh, second, because it's, it's not uh, adaptive enough. You have to, to adapt to, to small changes in the, in, the, in, the, in the control of the system. The system changes. It's, it's highly nonlinear, and therefore, um, these, these uh, strategies, these uh, goal-directed strategies, um, are often used for that. Um, yeah, maybe we can quickly have a look at the at the video of uh, the bionic handling assistant. So you can see it is very flexible and can easily reach all the positions uh, in, in, in its space. Um, but uh, the, the skills really have to be have to be learned. It's 
it's way too too complex to, to solve that uh, analytically. Then um, the other exploration strategy, the the intrinsic motivation, um, has been shown in the playground experiment. And in that experiment, this this robot here, an an Ibo robot from the Sony CSL Paris has been put into a children's playground. And it had several basic actions, like uh, uh, action primitives, uh, biting, bashing, and looking around. And um, it basically was just told to maximize the learning progress. So it chose to, to perform several of these actions. And um, from, with a higher probability, it chose actions where it predicted that the learning progress would um, be most, most steepest. The learning curve would be steepest and the, the, the progress um, uh, maximum. And by doing that, um, the robot shows different stages of development. So by just giving it this, this instinct, basically artificial curiosity, the robot started at the beginning, it was just uh, more or less looking around, learning the simple relationship between, OK, if I look to the left, then um, I, I see the, the, the objects on the left. If I look to the right, uh, I see the objects on the right. And after a while, it had its predictive capabilities to do that were really good. And then it switched to different behaviors. So then it started uh, biting this elephant's ears or bashing that, that toy and seeing the reaction and looking at the um, consequences of its own actions. And by doing that, uh, doing basically some, some open-ended learning and development. And um, I think we're a bit short of time, so um, we won't show the video now, but you can have a look at the, the playground video and on the on the web. Then, um, so we were looking at body maps now, we were looking at exploration strategies. Um, I'd like to show you um, at last uh, one particular experiment on sensory motor exploration with the, with the NOW robot. So the NAL robot was um, performing some, some random explorations and exploration and exploring the, the space um, of its arms and uh, where it could, could reach to. And um, after, after that learning phase, it, the robot could, could basically try to reach a certain point in its, in its um, in its space. So if you gave, for example, if you gave an object or showed an object to the robot, um, the robot realized that the, the object is in a particular space, place in its visual field and then could perform the, the experience motor action in order to reach that particular position. And um, to put that in a developmental, more in a de developmental context, um, we were looking at uh, young children and how they start doing pointing behavior. So pointing behavior, behavior is basically manipulating the attention of others. And so one hypothesis in psychology is that pointing could, be, could emerge from grasping. So basically, um, the child would, would, try to, would try to grasp something which is outside its field of reach, and then basically automatically perform this, this kind of pointing behavior. So that's one hypothesis, and we wanted to um, see whether something similar would, would emerge in, in our humanoid robot here. And so um, the, basically the robot just learned positions where it could reach. So the question was, what, what happens if you put that object outside the field of reach? Do you have any, any ideas? Anybody? He will put the hand as close as possible at the end being basically pointing that. 
Exactly, that's correct. Um, so the robot would try to minimize the, the, the prediction error here and put the hand as close as possible. And what is as close as possible if the object is out, out of the field of reach? Of course, it's basically this action of pointing here. So you can see it here. Basically, you have this, this sort of sphere, which is your um, field of grasp or reach. And the closest point is automatically this, this, this pointing, pointing action. So um, from, from just giving this, this, this simple mechanism to the robot, uh, pointing automatically emerged. And um, um, it showed a similar behavior that we observed in children. But of course, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't prove anything. But we can show that with these minimal principles, we can um, reproduce the, the, same, the same behavior. Then um, some future challenges of, of developmental robotics. Um, just to name but a few is, of course, language. So how can language emerge uh, during development? We will have a next week's main lecture by Anthony Morse from the University of Plymouth on that topic. And um, another even more high-level thing is mathematics. And there's a very nice book by, by Lake of I. I can recommend. And I think the, you can easily find the reference. And it's also written in, in um, Rob's book, um, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. So um, assignments for next week. So please read chapter five of the book. And we're also looking for, always looking for volunteers. So if you'd like to make a presentation, maybe on some developmental robot from your university, um, please let us know. So we always like to have some student presentations. Um, um, so please let us know. And that's the end of lecture five. So thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, please stay tuned for the guest lecture. I think we um, have a short, short break, maybe five minute break to get a coffee or some fresh air. Guest speaker. Can we ask a question? Oops. Oh, questions, yeah. Can we ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah? Um, so you are using the now robot to do the motor babbling for development. Now the now robot obviously has a completely different morphology from human beings and its dynamics you know is maybe not very interesting so you are considering motor babbling mostly as a kinematic problem uh, which implies that the now robot may be exactly learning the wrong kind of control schemes you know because it's not geared towards the dynamics, or because it doesn't have a proper dynamics. Uh, so how, what would you say to that point? Um, I agree. So the, the now robot is a very limited um, structure, and you can't really compare its, its uh, motor system with that of human beings. So in order to get closer, it's it's better to go to robots like the, the, the Festo robot we, we've just seen now. Um, but there are still some, some interesting properties you could learn. For example, um, there's a specific, um, there's still a specific dynamics in the, in the robot controller if you, put, uh, if you move the arm from this position to the other position. And there's actually some, some research on on how, for example, uh, how humans make make elliptic movements while writing, for example, um, there's a specific re relationship like the, the two-thirds power law, um, how the how humans do 
the velocity. So what we do, we accelerate in the in the corners and, and are slower in the in the normal action um, uh, movements. So uh, what we could see here, and that that's one particular point which is very interesting for for the string pushing between yourself and between others, that we have a different velocity profile, and so we can easily distinguish um, a typical robot controller profile from a human profile. So there are still some aspects which are quite interesting um, to explore, but of course you're completely right, the, the now robot is, is very limited in, in some other aspects in that. Okay, thanks for Anna. Are there any, any other questions? Okay, then we just um, have a three minute break now and then we continue with the guest section. And um, I'd like to announce next week's lecture, which is on also on developmental robotics, but on language. And uh, our the main speaker is Anthony Morse from Plymouth University in the UK. So see you uh, all next Verena. week. Serena, Verena, just before we just we were talking about the Plymouth, I wanted to congratulate uh, Martin Martin Stöller, who just got uh, a permanent position as a lecturer there in Plymouth. So I think we can oh, congratulate him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to contributing to the lectures for the next few years as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, then I guess that's it for this week. Thank you all for participating. Have a good week and see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.